Hey, what's happening, Rock Down Detroit Lions family? It is Will Rock with Rock Down Podcast Network, and I am joined with Andy B here. Andy, say what's up to everybody. What's up, everyone? Go Lions. What a first game. Yeah, so we are uh, 48 hours past game number one, or almost 48 hours past. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the result, even though I could have cared less if they won or lost the game. Uh, I was really impressed with with how the fourth quarter finished and how they kept fighting, which is uh, the Dan Campbell way. You know, they uh, they're full of grit and piss and vinegar, and they're just going to keep on going out there and kicking you in the teeth and uh, you know taking off a kneecap or an ankle or whatever it is, and uh, and keep keep fighting. So that was good to see. We have quite a bit to get through tonight. There was plenty to to take away from this first game. And, uh, Andy, is there anywhere that you would like to start, or do you want me to kick it off with uh, with the most glaring thing, I think, that, that took place on Friday night? Yeah, Will, why don't you start off with that, because that's something we talked about. Just kick it off here for us. So, for me, immediately, and with everybody watching or, or in the stands, and... Uh, and speaking of people in the stands, we did have a group of guys that got some tickets to the game from Rock Down Podcast and Rock Down Detroit Lions that sent us a, a shout out from our seats. And uh, so I want to thank you guys for for sending that video our way. It was uh, it was great. The goal Lions was excellent. So thanks for sending that. Uh, but the most glaring thing happened right away. Snap one, pass one, interception with Sudfeld. And uh, I, I can't say that I'm surprised. And the reason why is when I was at practice last week uh, for the second day of, of Giants open training camp for the fans, that's what I saw. I saw an inconsistent Sudfeld. I saw a lot of balls on the ground, which thankfully we didn't see on Friday night was a lot of balls on the ground. Um, but I saw plenty of interceptions by Sudfeld too, just in practice. He, he wasn't. Is either overthrown, underthrown, or in their hands. It just wasn't consistent. And I'm surprised, yet I'm not surprised, because throughout camp and throughout the offseason, Sudfeld has been nothing but very consistent, and he's been one of Dan Campbell's you know, highest praise, if you will, in, in a lot of press conferences, of how well, and Ben Johnson too, of how well Sudfeld has been growing in his first training camp. And his first OTAs, uh, in, you know, working with the Ben Johnson offense. So, like I said, I, I can't say that I'm surprised based on what was going down that week, but I am a bit surprised because I just didn't expect, you know, for the game to start that way. And I could only imagine what the fans were thinking, you know, 60 plus thousand that showed up to a preseason game um, of what they're about to witness that night. So, Anything you want to speak on with Sudfeld before I pour into him? Yeah, no, I just, you know, that first throw, I I don't want to say I resorted back to same old Lions, but I just, I did go to the fact of, you know what, I had, I had my bad feelings about Sudfeld. I didn't have a lot of faith in him when I saw that throw. You know, yeah, you could say he got hit in the back with it, but, you know, his pocket awareness is really, really a concern for me, and, I don't know if I'm kind of overstepping here, Will, but I know that one throw that he attempted to give to JMO and triple coverage, you know, I got to question decisions like that. You know, those are things about Sudfeld that I think are glaring issues going forward. And I hope they can get cleaned up. You know, we got two more weeks of preseason, but I, these are things that I think need to be concerning with this position that he's in right now. So there's been some things flying around on the interwebs of, you know, Sudfeld. Uh, one was can during halftime to Sudfeld's not going to make the roster. Um, if Sudfeld does make the roster, he's the fourth quarterback. So here's my opinion. I think that Sudfeld's got too much time involved into this offense, and it's such a, an intricate offense to learn that I don't think that they're going to can Sudfeld. Even if he doesn't have the greatest bounce back game next week against the Jags, which is going to be a very tough game against that defense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think the Lions are just going to give up on him. And, and, and quite honestly, I don't see why they would with Teddy Bridgewater in the house. I think that it's really going to take Teddy Bridgewater to 
shine very quickly and learn this offense very quickly for them to want to move on from Sudfeld. So it's too late for me in the game to move on from somebody that's been inside your offense for you know a little over uh, a year now, um, or almost a year now, and and there's not enough time on task with somebody like Teddy Bridgewater or an Adrian Martinez that makes me comfortable from moving on from Sudfeld, even though he didn't have the greatest of showing. Look, it's his first game start in a long time. Yeah, it's just a preseason game, uh, but he didn't have the number one offensive line out there. And uh, he didn't even have – well, he didn't – he had a very limited playbook. It was very vanilla, um, which is expected. So, you know, whatever they were trying to accomplish in that game, I don't think that it was – a terrible thing for it to start that way other than we didn't want to see it so no we didn't you know so he starts the season with an interception um the second possession he kind of makes a nice throw to drummond as an outlet up the the right sideline and um you know there was a linebacker that kind of ran freely up up the middle of the field on that play that that nailed sudfeld he really held on to the ball which he kind of did all night he was really holding on to the ball quite long which led me to believe that the offensive line was was holding at times and uh, you know giving him enough time to move but or at least get the ball off but he's holding on to the ball way too long he's letting the plays progress way too long he's got to get it up and down in a hurry and uh and if your immediate's not open you know stop looking them down and get down to the check and uh and make it happen so it was good to see that sudfeld you know did stay in the pocket and he did deliver the ball on time um but I, I need to see some more consistency out of Sudfeld next week. Uh, he did struggle against, uh, like I said, against the Giants all week in practice. So did he do enough to battle back the rest of the game is the question. Did he do enough to battle back and potentially stay on this team? That's something that he's going to have to answer next week. And uh, like I said, I don't think he's going anywhere. What do you got to say? Well, <clears throat> I know pre-show we kind of touched on this a little bit, buddy. Um I know you and I definitely always have pretty differences of opinions on things. I I agree with you. I'd like to see him improve next week against Jacksonville. You know, as you said, well, that that defense is going to be a, a really good test for our offense, but for Sudfeld as well. Personally, I was very happy with the way Martinez played. Um, I would actually like to see him get a little bit more playing time to see really – what kind of game and what he can do against a team like Jacksonville's defense. Because I think if you're going to start talking about, you've got golf, you got Bridgewater. Now you got to think about your third string, you know, if Sudfeld goes out there in like the first quarter, first half against Jacksonville and plays the way he does. I think you got to throw the ball over to Martinez more, start seeing if he might be a viable option as the third string, if it comes down to it. Now I don't disagree with you well about, you know, the time he's got invested in the offense. That's, that's a good point, but going forward as a team, you know, if he keeps up with this inconsistency, is this really the kind of insurance policy you want to have as another backup quarterback if the guy can't play consistently? That That's just kind of how I feel about it. You know, I know you and I have definitely variations of how we look at that, but that's just kind of where I stand on that one. You know, I'd like to see Martinez get more time to see if it's something that, you know, again, could be a more viable option for Sudfeld if the worst case scenario happens. So I do like Martinez, and and I do like his skill set better than than uh, Sudfeld. Yes. Um, the difference is Martinez is what six inches shorter than Sudfeld, so he isn't the tallest guy on earth. True. Uh, but he but he does have some wheels to him. He he is a playmaker. He showed it in college that he was able to move and make plays with his feet. Um, I think that Martinez has a better ball than Sudfeld. When I was watching him at the practice, he had a lot of zip. Sudfeld seems to hang passes out there to dry. And and that can get you in trouble in this league. You know, if you're not putting something behind it or at least getting it out early and you're trying to throw it late like Sudfeld often was on Friday, uh, you've got to have an arm to back it up, which he just doesn't have. Um, it's bad enough that people question Goff's arm, but if you really want to question somebody's arm, it's Sudfeld. Um yeah. So it's very it's very clear to me now as to why the Bridgewater signing was so important. Uh, let's just hope that Teddy can pick up the offense quickly and uh, get some action in a preseason game 
before the season starts. I, I haven't heard anything if, if Teddy's even going to play next week. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I wouldn't see why you wouldn't throw him out there in a lot of, you know, vanilla situations with a very limited right. playbook, get his feet wet and, uh, you know, develop some time on the field with the guys. But we'll see where that goes. Um, right. I think I want to end tonight's podcast, which we're not ending now, but I think I want to end tonight's podcast <laughs> really with with talking a lot about the defense. And and I'm not going to go into it right now because there's a lot to talk about on the defense. It was definitely the, the brightest, shiniest portion of this game uh, that stuck out to me. Um, so I think I want to move into more of a little, you know, more of the offense here. So I'm going to kick it over to you. What is one offensive player that you noticed in the game? Remember, we talked about Coda. We talked about Drummond. Um, we talked about Gibbs, Laporta. You know, all being guys that you want to watch. And uh, Laporta didn't have a big showing. He he was on the field for you know a few series and then he was out. You know, he had the one one big drop there on fourth down, which would have been an easy completion in a first down, but. Um, he didn't get a whole lot of action. He didn't get a whole lot of targets. What that tells me is that the Lions are really confident in his ability and where he lands on this roster. So outside of Laporta, what is, you know, or who is one of the guys that, that you picked on, you know, to talk about tonight? Well, you know, I want to start with, I think I'll just start with my, um, <clears throat> one of my dark horse picks that I really, you know, spoke highly of. I had to start with Dylan Drummond. You know, he only had two targets, two receptions for 12 yards. But, you know, I remember that one opening play actually that you alluded to, Will, that one throw that Sudfeld made to him. You know, it was impressive for me because, you know, he got he caught the ball real clean. He did make a little bit of a, you know, pitch to the right and showed a little bit of speed. And I just thought that was a, a really good way for him to start. You know, a good way, your first target in an NFL game, catch it, get a little bit of a run out of it. I was really impressed with what I saw. I know there was another another one that he took up the middle for some short yardage that was a good pass that he caught. So, I mean, right off the bat, he's um, – you know, I can't really judge him too much right off the bat, Will, because the reality is it was just two targets, two catches. But just that little tiny bit I saw, though, I mean, he was very engaged. He looked like he was on the same page with Sudfeld. And, and to me, those are promising things to, to see, in a, especially an undrafted receiver who – you know, wasn't even given a chance by anyone else. So he's definitely not my my class of the field in terms of who the rookies were out there. But I had to bring up Drummond first just because, you know, I spoke so highly of him. I know you and I had talked about him quite a few times. And he was making a lot of racket, you know, amongst a bunch of journalists and the coaching staff and whatnot. I know Campbell speaks very highly of him and likes what he's capable of. So, you know, I don't mean to make this a prediction type of conclusion about – Drummond, but <clears throat> coming up next week, I really I want to see more of him. I want to see the, the the two catches he made, the little bit of moves he made, and the speed he had. I'd like to see that showcase a little bit more coming up next week. And I hope he does get more targets because I think he's got real good potential. I was actually really pleased with you know the little bit I saw of him uh, going forward. I don't know if you have the same opinion about Drummond or whatnot, but I just I was I was happy with the little bit I saw. Well, it wasn't a, a large sampling size for Dylan Drummond no. on Friday night, but I, I will tell you this, you know, he's six foot, he's 23 years old, he's about 190 pounds, and, uh, and he can move. And he's shown his willingness to to go out there and make plays and to get dirty and to throw blocks, and, and he just makes plays. I mean, that's some guys in the league, they just make plays. Mm -hmm. They just, for whatever reason – they just get it done. And Dylan Drummond is one of those guys that for whatever reason, he finds himself in the right place at the right time, doing the right things. And when those three things happen, great things happen on the field. And for me, I think if Dylan continues his work ethic and continues to grow within this offense, he could round out or right. He could round out the wide receiver group as the last guy in, but I think it's a, uh, it's a hail Mary you know, to not bring in green or Mims. It's just, is Mims going to get back on the field quickly uh, to be able to show us something in a preseason game? And, right. and I'm hope I'm hopeful that he is. I haven't read any updates on, on Mims today, but I'm sure there'll be some things out tomorrow. 
And uh, and just so everybody knows, RockedOnPodcastNetwork.com has been in a little bit of a lull on writing. Uh, we are going to pick up the articles again here for the season here. We're going to start in the next week or so. Um, we are looking for writers. If anybody would like to come in and, and you know freelance some writing for Rock Down Detroit Lions and Rock Down Podcast Network, please send us an email at info at rockedonpodcastnetwork.com. And we'd be more than happy to get you set up. And uh, we appreciate anybody that wants to, uh, to help us out. So Dylan Drummond, he's your dark horse to make the roster. I think he's, um, you know, he's probably the eighth best receiver on this this team right now, but he's definitely making a case for himself. So moving right along, uh, what other offensive player did you you target uh, to take a look at and talk about tonight? Well, the other one was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of a scratchy throat tonight, so please, everyone, I apologize and bear with me. Uh, the other one is your dark horse, Will, um, Antoine Green. I actually, from the minute I was able to watch the game, I was really excited to see him. And uh, I thought of you quite a bit because I know that, you know, he's your, uh, he's kind of your darling. Um, but he had another, it was another nice look for him. He had three targets, three receptions for 36 yards. All his catches were great. The one that was really the biggest one for me was um, third quarter. It was a second and eight. And uh, Sudfeld threw a bullet at him and he went right up the middle with it and picked up that first down. Showed some good power, some good speed from what I saw with that, and uh, he he didn't go down easy. I think it took uh, I think it took about two defenders to get him down after that run. So he's another one. He's he's makes the catches. You know he needed to, and he I thought he played a really exceptional game. I mean the little bit of I mean and it could also probably be like Dylan Drummond, maybe a little bit too little sample size, but I saw a little bit more out of Green than I did see out of Drummond, and that's why I think I have a little bit more of a more of an outlook, if you will, on how I saw the way Green played. But Green was right where he needed to be. I, I looked like him and Sudfeld. That, you know, I know we talked about Sudfeld as inconsistency, but there was a lot of them being on the same page when they were making the passes and the, and the catches to each other. So I really liked Antoine Green. I uh, kind of like Drummond. I really hope to see more of him next week. I think he's got potential to be a really good receiver. I don't know if he – potentially does make that spot. I think it could kind of come down between him and Drummond for that final roster spot. And again, we have to go back to seeing what Mims is going to do, but I really was impressed with green. Um, your guy really did impress me. Well, I was very happy with what I saw. So everything that I said about Drummond, I would repeat about green. He's just another guy that makes plays and he puts himself in the right position to make these plays and it all goes back to his college years and what he's been able to put on tape uh, so far in this, this preseason and OTAs is, is simple. He's very explosive. He has very good, if not excellent, lateral footwork. And that's what I paid attention to on Friday night was his route running and his footwork and how it's lining up to where he's catching the ball. And if he's putting himself in a position to tuck and run and, and to turn up field and gain some yak, He's going to be a guy that's that's going to be able to do that, but he's also another vertical threat specialist, in my opinion, that the Lions just can't have enough of. You know, J-Mo, uh, well, we'll get into him in a minute. but Yeah, let's, let's not do that right now. If, if j not able to suit up, you know, for these six weeks, the Lions <laughs> need another vertical threat. So, in my opinion, you know, he's he's a confident guy. He's He's quietly confident on the field. Uh, he's very capable at, at making tremendous plays for the Lions this season. Um, and he's got very reliable hands. I, I don't, I haven't seen Green drop anything yet. Again, we're not in every practice. We're not looking at every play. Um, but I, I just, I haven't seen it yet. And I'm not hearing any negative energy coming from the media or from anybody inside training camp uh, about Green. I only hear positive things or nothing at all. So for me. That's why I feel like Antoine Green is going to make this roster. And uh, I do want to see a larger sampling size, though. So if j is going to get a lot more targets next week, Green's got to get just as many. Um, I, I want to see them both produce. And I'm really hoping that Mims gets his, you know, his, his <clears throat> act together and gets back on the field and gets by that injury. So, all right. So my offensive player, or at least one of them, 
uh, that I'd like to, to chat about is Jameer Gibbs. Yes. Now, look, everyone loves Jameer and what he's been able to show us so far in this offseason. And, and he's been nothing but but stellar. And, and he's having a hell of an offseason. So we expected a lot on Friday night. We shouldn't have because we had this, the twos and the threes in there for an offensive line. So we didn't really get that large sampling size, you know, that we expected out of Gibbs. And, you know, he got his 18 snaps, I think it was, and, and he was retired for the night. So he definitely got a full quarter, about 18 snaps. All of his snaps came out of the backfield, which was a bit surprising to many of us, you know, after watching and hearing all off season long that he was going to be used as a route runner and somebody out of the slot and somebody definitely going to, you know, be able to take, more of a passing role, you know, out of the backfield uh, or receiving role out of the backfield, excuse me. And so that didn't happen on Friday. Um, he did snag one pass for 18 yards. It kind of looked like a, a broken play, a, a broken screen play, if you will. Uh, but he did snag it. He, he kind of turned around and reached, you know, about knee level for it and was able to snag it, turn around, gain a few extra yards. And, uh, and it was exciting to watch, you know, seeing that he can control his body and and make the play on a soft throw um it's just preseason you know it's just a preseason game i'm sure ben johnson is protecting a lot of his secrets and and doesn't want to put a lot of you know his best plays out there um you know until the game really matters but gibbs was impressive nonetheless uh, especially like i said earlier with the second and third string off you know offensive line in there he he managed, you know, well, he was able to keep the quarterbacks clean. He picked up blocks. Uh, you know, he did what he had to do to, uh, you know, put something on the film, uh, put something on the game tape, at least. Um, give, give me one second here. I'm trying to fix, fix this. I apologize. <clears throat> your, your volume is just really high for some reason. And it's not letting me fix it. So, Andy, could you mute yourself for just a second, and then I can fix it. Gotcha. All right, so back to Gibbs. You know, Gibbs shined in his in his opportunities that he had. Uh, he protected the ball well, protected the quarterback well. Uh, like I said, he he put plenty of blocks on tape, and, and uh, we're going to see more of that out of Gibbs. He's not afraid to get in there and get scrappy. Uh, he even got in on the interception that Sudfeld threw to start the game. And when I watched this, it put a giant smile on my face because this kid ran right down the sideline and put a perfect form tackle on, uh, I think the guy's name was Pinnock uh, from the Giants, and leveled him. Just put him right into the turf, stood over him, and ended the play. That's the type of scrappiness and the grit that the Lions are looking for. Gibbs wasn't afraid to, to get in the mix and uh, wasn't afraid to help out his guy Sudfeld in stopping the bloodshed after the interception. Uh, give me one second, Andy. I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to try to fix this volume before we do, and it's not letting me. So if you see your volume toggle on your side, just slide it all the way down to about 15%. How is it? Now, it hasn't moved. On the screen, on the, on your mm -hmm. left side, underneath your name, okay. there's, vo there's volume there. you got to slide that slider all the way down. Oh, now mine just went all the way up. Apologize, everybody. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. So just try not to talk as loud because it's going to be really amplified on the other side. Okay, gotcha. All right, so let's get into uh, let's get into somebody else that you had on on your watch list for Friday night. Well, I will say, do I sound okay, Will? Yeah, you're good. Okay. <clears throat> well, the other one that was really 
I think he was the star of the rookies and undrafted for that matter. Uh, Chase Coda. Chase Coda had great numbers. He was targeted seven times for four receptions and 60 receiving yards. Uh, he was the star of the undrafted rookies. There's no doubt about it. He, he became Sudfeld's favorite target because um, he already had good chemistry with him. I guess I read somewhere that him and Sudfeld practiced together down in Bend, Indiana. So they already had the chemistry there, which I'm sure that definitely helped. Uh, Dan Campbell, very impressed with him, calling him somewhat of a dark sleeper because somebody, you know, Campbell felt that he was somebody that nobody was going to actually expect to come out and do really anything big about. Um, he's just overall, he, he, he came there to work. He, he, and Campbell says that about a lot of his receivers that are doing really good things. I mean, he shows up, he shows up to play, he makes the plays. He was there in every critical situation that, you know, Sudfeld needed him to be in. It, good speed, good hands. Uh, not afraid to get dirty. You know, he take a hit with no issues. So Chase Cota right now, out of all the undrafted and rookie receivers that were on the field, he was the most impressive. Um, I don't know that he makes the final roster, though. Um, you know, Will and I Will and I have discussed time and time again how much depth we have on every position and every side of this team, defense and offense. And I would – lock him in as a practice squad player, but to make a final roster spot position, I can't see it happening. Uh, Will, I know you and I talked about that. I don't know how you feel about it, but overall preseason, he's going to keep making noise. I think he'll still be a really good target. I really was happy with the way he played. He really, really surprised me because I didn't really think much of the guy coming into the preseason. So he impressed me quite a bit and keep hoping to see good things from him. Will, what do you think? Well, I, I really don't have much on Coda. Um, you know, he, I really can't say much more than what you did. Um, you know, he was impressive in his, in his debut Friday night. Uh, the history is definitely there between him and, and Sudfeld. You know, they've been working a lot together this off season and he was the favorite target, you know, of both quarterbacks on Friday night. So he's definitely a practice squad guy. And I, and I hate to, I hate to see that, you know, for some of these guys that do so well, but. You know, there's there's definitely a couple of Tom Kennedys on the team, guys that are going to be working their butts off. They're going to be making plays. Um, they're going to look great in preseason, and they're not going to make the team. Um, and, and like I said in, you know, Friday's show, this is the difference between the Detroit Lions of 2021 and, and prior, where our guys, you know, get picked up through UDFA or, you know, late-round draft picks. That if if they get cut, they're gonna get sniped now. As where before they stuck around and made a practice squad. I don't see that happening with happening with some of the better players that we have on this this very deep roster. Right. Chase Coda, I'd love to see him stick around. I, I just I think that there's the potential for somebody to want to grab Coda as as well as you know put them on put him on their practice squad at some point, but uh, he would have to make their initial 53-man roster. I'm sorry, not the initial. He'd have to be uh, selected to their 53-man roster, I believe. Um, I'll have to look back into, into how all that works again. But at any rate, I don't expect Coda to make this roster. I, I would hope that he sticks around in the practice squad, but I think there's a couple receivers in front of him, Drummond being one of them. Um, I don't see the Lions keeping, you know, 10 receivers – between no, they the won't. roster, yeah, between the roster and and uh, and the practice squad. But. Well, and and you know, uh, and real quick, just, just to piggyback off your point, real quick, well, and, and you do hate to think that maybe he doesn't make the team or or does get cut, because if he does for some chance happen to have a stellar game against the Jags and he has a preseason finale game where he just plays like a stud and they still don't keep him, well, it's a shame that we lose him. But then you know what? He winds up being hopefully beneficial for another team that might be able to snag him. So. You're right. It's you hate to see him go. You hate to lose him, but that's just that's the casualty of having a a really deep roster like we do. Well, the other thing too is uh, you know a lot of this early preseason work is it's an audition tape. These mm -hmm. guys are putting tape together so that they can get picked up by other teams. Um, the last guy that I had on my list before we get to Jamison uh, was Alexander in his punt return. This is uh, Maurice Alexander, you know, in my opinion, is not going to make this team. 
he definitely should make the uh, the practice squad. I think he's ahead of Coda and ahead of Drummond. That's just me. I don't think a lot of people would agree with that. But we don't have, you know, the kick return and punt return players really figured out. Raymond is, uh, you know, a punt returner, right? Mm -hmm. But he's not really a kick returner. So who else can we put back there? You could put Jameson back there when he's healthy. You could put Jameer Gibbs back there, but I wouldn't want to do that to Gibbs. No. You know, who are you going to put back there? And, and do you really want to waste a roster spot for an Alexander that really isn't going to give you much, you know, as far as offensive production may give you a little bit in, in you know, teams work, but primarily just as a kick and a punt return. So, uh, you know, I'm glad to see he got a nice return the other night. It was fun to watch. Um, we need more plays like that, but I just – I don't see the kid making the roster and, and it's unfortunate because he's got so much talent and, uh, and he has so much to offer and, and he's going to be somebody that gets picked up though. That, that's just okay. my opinion. Easily. So let's move into JMO, you know, damn it, JMO. Uh, I wanted him to really prove me wrong and, uh, and come out and shine and blow the doors off. And, I, and I'm just going to say it. You know, people aren't going to like it. But last season, everyone was saying that the pass that he dropped in the end zone was all of Goff's fault. You know, okay, so was the ball just a little behind? Sure. But did it touch his hands? It absolutely did. And it almost went into his bread basket. So that's a catchable ball. Should have caught it. Why was the ball late or could have been a little late? Well, it was pretty much a broken play when you really go back and break it all down. And there was a push off that wasn't called. And, you know, a 50 yard pass is not an easy feat for any quarterback, but mm -hmm. uh, a 50 yard pass when someone is already at the 20 yard line, you, you're definitely never going to get the ball down there as quick as they're going to get to the end zone. Mm -hmm. So it is what it is. Right. But we saw that drop. We'll call it a 50, 50 wash golf's fault and in Jamo's fault 50, 50. Okay. But then we go to practice this season, off season, OTAs, training camp. All we hear is drops, 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 drops. JMO has a case of the drops. He's not running good intermediate routes. His route running is pathetic. He's a deep route runner. He's, you know, somebody that's a deep threat. He can catch a lobbed deep ball, but he's not somebody so far that has proven himself to be able to run with the big dogs and catch the balls no matter where they are. Marvin, St. Brown, I, I don't, you know, there's there's plenty of guys out there that will make the plays. The ball's a little behind, the you know, or the ball's a little in front, it's a little high, it's a little low. They're going to go after it and get it. Jamo had one of two options in that, that pass from Sudfeld, which was a perfectly thrown ball. If he felt like it was in front of him, he should have dove, right? But he didn't yep. need to dive because the ball hit his hands. And it cleanly hit his hands. So another huge drop by j -Mo. And And look, again, we're not really trying to crucify the kid. We want him to succeed. We want him to come and blow the doors off the defenses when he gets back. But here's my, here's my problem. He was in for 25 snaps, okay? He didn't really have an impact on the game other than a negative one. And my biggest concern is that JMO is, is so inconsistent and flashy, right? The Lions need consistency, not flashiness. Um, he's he's two out of seven. He had two catches out of seven attempt, uh, you know, seven attempts on Friday night and dropped one ball out of seven targets. So that's a 14% drop rate, right? It's terrible. The league average is like 6.1%. It's just not going to cut it. You know, he did have that stellar one-handed grab in the end zone for the, the two-point conversion, but again, it was a very well-placed ball. So he should have caught it. And, uh, you know, in his first preseason game, 
And I know it's just his first preseason game, but there shouldn't be any excuses by now. He played six games last season. You know, he got in at least, what, 80-some-odd snaps last season. Uh, it's the most snaps he's had in a, in a game so far. Um, he just has to clean it up. He's got to clean it up quickly. You know, the positive side to this, though, and there is, there is a, a, a big positive to what I saw on Friday, is his route running was a lot better. He was a little bit more crisp inside or in and out of his breaks. Okay. I did watch his footwork and I did watch how he was able to go in and, and you know, free up some guys with some big hits and blocks. So he wasn't afraid to mix it up. So if he's not producing as a pass catcher, he's at least trying to do something and he's not just giving up. I think the kid's a fighter. I think that he's going to bounce back. We're going to shake off the first game as a little bit of cobwebs. He's had a rough off season. So, like I said, we're not trying to ride the guy too much, but the excuses of this fan base, you know, that we're all making for this guy uh, and, and our lack of accepting that, you know, what we're seeing on and off the field could end up being our reality. We might just have to suck it up. Jamal's going to prove us wrong, though, right? That's what you're going to say, isn't it? Of course it is. Why wouldn't I say it? Because because that's the problem. I mean, you got too many people, too many Jamison fans, too many Lions fans. They they look at people like us, Will, and they, you know, they think that we're trying to crucify the guy. Yeah, I I was excited for the pick last year when we got him. You know, I was really excited when he came on the field for the first time. I mean, yeah, that yeah, one catch, forty five yards. But I loved how lightning fast he was. I mean, there's a reason why we traded up to grab them. So, I mean, anybody's got to realize that people like myself, Will, anyone who actually understands the game, we're not crucifying the guy as if he's a, a horrible receiver. We're just saying that there is there is a little bit of a pattern, though, right now with off the field and on the field stuff, and I just really want to see it get, as Will said, it needs to get cleaned up. You know, he needs uh, – I, I heard them saying he's not getting the separation he used to get – when he played in college, well, he's got to get that figured out quick, though, because college and NFL are two different breeds of animals, we know. And, you know, if you can't get separation, you can't get those things going in the NFL, then you're going to have problems. So, but you're right, Will, my compatriot in crime. There's no way this is going to be a bad thing. We're all wrong, and he's going to be just fine. And we're not going to worry I hope about so. it. Look, you know, we're, we're being a little I, sarcastic with it, but it's, look, j has got a tough road to hoe in front of him he really does. Oh, he does he does and 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 everybody in the media you know doing what we're doing they're all kind of seeing the you know the light here that jamal's a project and and that's not what anyone expected you know everyone expected that he was going to heal up he was going to hit the field and he was going to be a burner and the new lions air raid offense was going to be alive and it just it just hasn't clicked yet. So, you know, he's he's got a few more years under contract if he makes it that long, and uh, we'll see what happens. But in in no way are we going to give up on him yet. Not at least no. until week seven of the regular season when he comes back. We'll see how he does. So, let's move over to the defense, which you know, by all intents and purposes, the defense was insane. So beyond insane, it was, it was good to see that the defense finally came out and showed us that they can help us win games. And, uh, and that's what we needed to see because quite honestly, the defense is the biggest reason why the the Lions were able to come back. And, uh, we didn't put up a lot of points. We didn't, you know, weren't flashy with a lot of things that the offense was doing. It was a grinded out kind of game. And, uh, it took the defense to, to make it happen it took special teams to make it happen and uh and that's what happened so where would you like to start i know where i want to start but do you want to start with sack masters or should we just jump into the the rookie that made a big impact for himself well i'd like to jump into the sack masters i think you and i can both gloat about the star of the show for the night as far as i'm concerned at a certain point here but i gotta talk about it five sacks on the Giants quarterbacks for this game for Julian, Romeo, and Benito Jones. 
I mean, Julian had three of them, and then Romeo and Benito had one apiece to round it out. But five sacks for this defense, it, it was – it was something that we needed to see. It was something I was happy to see because, uh, you know, kind of going back real quick, Will, the offense was pretty underwhelming this game. I, I really I really felt they were. So to see the defense, you know, show what they were made of, and, and this isn't even all the starting players either. These aren't even like the, you know, the first team players either, and they played as well as they did. I just – they just shined on Friday night. They gave, they gave me just every – they were one of the reasons why I was screaming at the TV was just because how phenomenal I saw these guys on defense play. They were getting all the interruptions. They were given the offensive line headaches. They just did everything you would expect them to do as a whole. I love seeing Julian because Julian Aquara, one thing Dan Campbell said about him is that he needed to see consistency with Julian. Well, he gave it to him. He gave it to him ferociously. He was unstoppable. Absolutely. Well, that's, on that, Friday. That, that's just one night, though. We, let's not get too I, far ahead of ourselves with Julian. I, I love to see Julian back in the saddle, but he's had a lackluster couple of seasons with Detroit. He may finally be coming out of his shell, and you're right about one thing. He definitely needs consistency. Um, but his big three sacks on uh, you know for the day definitely pushed the needle closer to his camp battle with James Houston. So go ahead and finish uh, what you're about to say. Oh yeah, no, no, and I and, and you know don't don't get me wrong. I agree with you, Will. It is just one preseason game, but to see him come out and essentially be challenged by Campbell, you know, to say I need to see more consistency and play the way you did. I mean, it's a promising start. It doesn't mean next week it's going to be that way. I mean, he could come out next week and it could be a total opposite performance where we don't even mention his name at all. But I just think for the way the offense kind of didn't play and then have the defense come out the way they did. That was just a very, very shining star in my, in, in my opinion. It's just the way they played. They were interrupting the run. They were they were just frustrating the quarterback. I mean, you could tell they were making all the holes necessary for Aquara, the Aquara brothers and for Benigno Jones to get in there to make the plays that they did. I'm very happy with what I saw with this defense, Will. It was it was something, I mean, because they went, you know, from a gap to the gap and a half, which, you know, you and I talked about that pre-show. It really makes a – puts a lot more responsibility on the players, more a lot more accountability. I just was very impressed with it. It was a great showing by this defense. If you have anything to add with that, Will. Yeah, I think I'm going to start back at the beginning, though, um, to kind of give some, you know, shed some light here on how the defense got started. And quite honestly, it started with Brian Branch. So very first, you know, period uh, of defense, we saw, you know, Brian Branch really step into his own. And, and quite honestly, he's been doing it all offseason. But when you have a rookie like Brian Branch that's able to come into his first preseason game and do what he did and work with the rest of the defense in the way that they did together, it just shows me that this team is finally on the same page. The defense is finally on the same page. And we'll get into the gap, you know, the gap responsibilities too, but I think it started with Branch, right? And his strong performance in, in showing, you know, his versatility both as a, a cornerback and a uh, and a safety uh, and starting off with that huge hit on Beasley. Um really set the tone on Friday night for what this defense was going to do. So at the very outset of the Lions, uh, I think it was their first series on defense, Brian Branch comes from the opposite hash, right, and makes that that amazing hit on Beasley, which Be Beasley's no slouch. I mean, he's not the player he used to be, and that play was going nowhere. Uh, but there's a reason why it wasn't going anywhere, and that's the other person that really shined on Friday night, uh, which was the commish in Kaminsky. But essentially, here's the way it went down. The play starts out where Tyrod Taylor is kind of staring down his tight end a little bit. Beasley comes in motion, runs uh, in front of Taylor, and you know Kaminsky is coming off the edge, and the tight end runs right by him. 
Well, at that point, Kaminsky realized, wait a second, <laughs> you're going to leave me unblocked? You know, what's going on here? So he picked up Beasley, and he kind of jammed Beasley a little bit behind the line of scrimmage, legal play, and uh, was kind of moving laterally, you know, adjusting towards Tyrod Taylor. And here comes Branch. He passes Campbell, passes Savion Smith, runs all the way around the other side of the field. Tyrod Taylor dumps the ball off the Beasley before Kam you know, Kaminsky takes uh, Taylor out. And Branch levels the boomstick on him. <laughs> I mean, it was my the goodness. Beautiful, beautiful it, it hit. Does, it doesn't get any more textbook than this. Um, I still don't understand why Branch was on the other side of the field and why Campbell, you know, Jack Campbell never moved. Uh, I, I'm going to have to watch that play again, but it didn't make any sense. To me. Uh, Campbell did move up, you know, one, while the play was developing, but I still don't know why Branch was on the other side of the field. I, I know that he obviously read the play, you know, he sniffed it out and, uh, Man, hats off to Branch. What what a hell of a play. And, and perfect, perfect tackling. I mean, not only did he use his shoulder, but he wrapped him up with his right arm. You know, oftentimes DBs, they get a bad rap because they shoulder hit a lot or they hip check a lot and they don't really tackle. Uh, Branch is a tackler and, and he's a hitter. Um, so Branch lights it up on the night, man. First, first, first defensive series they get in and, and he does this. But what was really impressive to me, now I'll get through this, and then Andy, I'll throw it to you. What was really impressive to me was was Kaminsky. Watching him jam Beasley, and allowing Branch, you know, time to get over to make that hit, and you know, get down to make make the hit, uh, just shows one when 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 he recognized that play and what was happening. It just shows how intelligent and 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 why he's one of the smartest D linemen in the league. Um, and he proved it. He proved it on that play, and he proved it throughout the night. He identified that nobody, you know, would come out to block him. He sunk down on the edge and laterally adjusted to the quarterback. You know, he, he made Tyrod Taylor have to do something. It was either take the sack or dump it off. He dumped it off, and then the Beasley paid the price. But Kaminsky was a terror all night long. It wasn't just that play. He was a tear in almost every play he was in. He was constantly disruptive. His play was technically sound. Textbook. I mean, the guy just, he does everything right. He got into the backfield. Probably the majority of the plays that he was in on, he was either, you know, in on the tackle, next to the tackle, forcing the tackle, forcing a pocket disruption, stopping a run, you name it. He was in on everything. And he plays very smart. He played a very clean game. There's a reason why Kaminsky is, is so highly regarded by Campbell and AG. And he showed it again on Friday night. I can only imagine the two that worked well last year that, that probably worked the best was Kaminsky and Hutchinson. When Kaminsky was in, Hutchinson had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain a little bit more on that you know, as to why in a minute. But I can't wait to see Hutchison back on the field with Kaminsky. So, you know, playing smart, playing clean, playing within the scheme, playing within his assignment, um, it really yielded a ton of production. And, and I've said this before, I could care less about stats, and Kaminsky probably could care less too. Because there's a difference between stats and production. When you are able to produce within your position, and you are able to play a clean and smart game and, and be well-disciplined within your assignment, and you're able to push the pocket so that maybe the guy next to you can make a play, that's production. Yes. You may not get the tackle. You may not get the, the stat, the sack, the, you know, the interception, the batted ball, whatever it is, the TFL. You may not rack up all those, but the guy next to you is, and there's a reason for it. And... And that's what Kaminsky offers. So I've said it earlier in, in, in one of our shows that stats are meaningless. And, and I guess I just said it again, but they're only meaningless if you're producing. <clears throat> if you're not producing and you don't have stats, well, then there's a bigger problem. 
Um, <laughs> but that's that's how I kind of wanted to kick off the defense. So give me your thoughts on Branch and Kaminsky, and then let's move back into the Accor brothers. Well, Branch and Kamis- K- uh, Kaminsky, Kaminsky, there we go. Yeah, I, I couldn't. You know, Will, you and I were we were we were pouring over tape. I remember, you know, a little while ago and just looking at what everyone was doing on the defense that night. And Kaminsky just seemed like he was there interrupting every single time he had to cleanly. I like about branch. Cause he, you were right. We were actually talking about the play in general of the big hit on Beasley. He just, he came out of nowhere. Uh, he plays both sides of the field. You know, he can play a slot corner and everything, you know, he disrupts that part of the field. Yeah, I can't say enough about Kaminsky. You know, the stuff that you and I were diving into on film, it was, you know, just he was always there to interrupt, get everyone set up for what they needed to do. It just, he was just, he's just on top of it every time. He plays clean. He's not there to be overly flashy. He's just every single th- thing that I saw him do on the field on Friday, you, you couldn't ask a, a, a person that of his position to do it any cleaner or better than he could have. It, it was just an amazing thing to see. And, and then to see Brian Branch be able to be the take advantage of that <clears throat> and feed off the way he was playing, well, then that says it all in itself, too. Brian Branch, he's he is, I, I will say, he's the next big thing. The, the, the type of plays he put out there, that hit on Beasley, he was just everywhere. It just, you know, it almost kind of, I'm not going to say he's like him, but I remember uh, Troy Palomalu. It seemed like you could look somewhere on the field and he just always pop up somewhere he just always knew where to be branch kind of was doing that to me too it just seemed like everywhere i looked branch was there now again i'm not making don't misunderstand i'm not making a comparison that you know branch yeah, those, is, those are giant shoes be careful you got a no, lot of people i i get it right now uh, no i'll tell you i'm not doing that i'm not saying branch is as good or he, he's going to be like paul amalo there's paul amalo was out of his mind I'm just saying what I saw, it was like, wow, there was another player who was like that. It was all over the place at any given time. So, again, I'm not making that. That's an unfair comparison, but I just – I loved what I saw. I'm glad we brought Kaminsky back, Will. I'm glad that we went and got our hands on Branch. You know, I expect nothing but <clears throat> nothing but good things from him, and I think we're going to see more pounding hits and all over the place type of activity from Branch next week and going forward. I'm really happy with what I saw. You're right, Will. I agree with you 100% about especially Comiskey. He's unbelievable. Unbelievable in every way you could ask him to be. Do me a favor and and check the chat real quick because I think for whatever reason, uh, I think the sign-in issue tonight is what's what's happening here. I don't see anybody in the chat, Will. It says there's eight notes. It says there's six. Right. But I don't see anybody. It's saying it's uh, nothing to see here. If you could pull it up, that'd be great. I can't. It won't come. No, I, my- it's not pulling up. Next time no. we just gotta we just gotta sign in differently. I think. So all right. So branch Apologies is a stud. Everybody. Yeah. So branch is a stud, <clears throat> and Kaminsky's a stud. I mean, these, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, Branch is considered, a, you know, a second-team guy right now uh, by depth chart purposes only. But in my opinion, he has the opportunity, based on what we saw. So when we were breaking down tape today, I saw a lot of uh, five defensive backs, which is what I expected, uh, whether they're going to play in the cover three, um, you know, or, or play in, in, in a shell or use zone there's room to have five defensive backs on the field at any given time. And I feel like the direction that Brad Holmes and and Dan Campbell went in this offseason was, one, let's fix our DB problem. And then, oh, by the way, let's get a lot better in that position so that we can run more cover three and and bring that extra man up in the box. And I'm going to explain why that is and is not important with – the next topic, which is gap assignments. So before we go back into Julian Aquora, you brought up a point that was mentioned in the broadcast on Friday night and something that I didn't get a chance to witness in practice because I was on the other side of the field. But it's this new gap strategy that the Lions are putting in into in, play now. So last season they played with a one gap assignment and 
you know, essentially what that means is you're responsible for the gap in front of you, right? The, the best analogy that I could give you is, you know, imagine that you put your arms out at a 90 degree, you put one arm straight in front of you and you put the other arm straight out to the right or to the left. That's the gap you're responsible for. Now move that, that other arm to 135 degrees. Now you got 135 degrees of coverage in front of you. That's your gap and a half. So you're responsible for the half a man next to you, left or right, depending on where you're lined up and what the scheme tells you to do and what your assignment is, right? So now if you have two guys that are basically covering three gaps, you've eliminated a position on the defensive line. You no longer need four guys on the defensive line. You can have uh, you know, five, guy, five defensive backs in, but now you no longer need that seventh man up in the box or that sixth man up in the box. So essentially what a gap and a half is, is in this system, you know, the, the run defense is designed to clog the middle. You know, you want to clog the middle. You want to bounce the runs outside where the linebacker and the safeties are rotating down to make the plays. So think about the guys they brought in. They brought in Jack Campbell, who has incredible uh, lateral ability from sideline to sideline, great speed, length, and height, right? You brought in Brian Branch, who is a slot corner cornerback and also can play safety. You have C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who can do the same. You have Kirby Joseph, who has range. You have Tracy Walker, when he's healthy, who has range. And all of these guys love to hit. They're all thumpers. So if you're playing gap and a half and you've now freed up the backfield of not having to have that extra guy come into the box, imagine how much more opportunity these guys have now to go make plays. And we saw it. We saw it in the game. Not as often as I think we're going to see it during the season, but we did see it in this preseason game. So these guys with gap and half again. They're trying to clog the middle, bounce the plays outside where the linebacker and the rotating safety that's coming down can make the plays. I can see where C.J. Gardner or Brian Branch or Kirby Joseph are going to rotate down to make some incredible hits all season long. I can see where uh, a Malcolm Rodriguez or a James Houston or a Jack Campbell is going to be rolling down and just making some you know vicious hits and some amazing tackles. The defense wants to pile or make a pile if you will in the middle so no more squirts up the middle like we saw last season no more jalen hurts you know or justin fields running up the gut you know or or hubbard chula hubbard chuba hubbard sorry running up the gut you know for hundreds of yards it, it's gonna it's gonna hopefully put an end to it as long as they can be disciplined within these assignments we're gonna see a much improved defense this season so they want to make this pile in the middle with fewer people handling the gaps versus, you know, a three, four or a four, three play in one gap or two gap, you know, now you're able to do the same thing, play in a gap and a half. You're able to, you know, free up your guys to go make plays, which in my opinion, is just my opinion, but I think it's going to do what Andy, I think it's going to free up Hutchinson. I think it's going to free mm -hmm. up James Houston. I think yes. it's going to free up the Sam linebacker. And I think it's going to free up these safeties to come down and do more blitzing. So we'll see what happens. But playing a gap and a half, uh, you know, this team now can play with six players in the box rather than seven. Yes. So I, I feel like it's uh, it's a game changer for us. And, and please, next time, you know, the Lions come on next week, look for it. You know, see if, see if we're right. See if it happens. Um, I'm expecting it to happen, and I'm expecting it to work. This is probably the biggest change to the defense outside of 3-4 four to 4-3 four, that I think the Lions have done in, in two or three decades, and, and it's going to be a game changer. So I'm really excited. If you can't tell already, I'm really excited to see where this is going to go <laughs> with the starters. So, All right, so Julian Okora, a uh, guy played, I mean, out of his mind, right? He did. Three sacks, correct? Yes, Three sacks for him, one for uh, Romeo, and one for um, one for Jones. So the Benito Jones sack was uh, the first sack of the game, and yes. you know, here's what I here's what I saw. So Benito gets in, he gets, uh, I believe he had outside leverage at the beginning of that play. When he rolls in, right, he was able to get a, a free hand on the quarterback as he was trying to run through the pocket. 
I think that's what that gap and a half strategy is going to allow these guys to do more of is to be able to make plays through the center of the defense. Cause again, they're trying to pile up the middle. If everyone's crashing in the middle, someone's going to get free somewhere. But Benito Jones mm-hmm. really powered his way through on that play and uh, and extended. And when you're able to make plays outside of your zone or outside of your reach, like he was able to and extend, that, that's what the that's what we're looking for. You know, you're looking mm-hmm. for these guys, you know, to play uncomfortable, comfortable football. And uh, and I think that's probably what they're going through right now. And that's why this defense is going to be so successful is is they're going to be able to play a little bit more free. Um. Do you have anything on James Houston, or do you want me to go into James Houston? I don't have anything on James, actually, no, sir. Go ahead and go into that. So, you know, we're talking about how Julian and Benito uh, or Romeo had a wonderful day, right? Amazing day. And it's been a long time since we've seen it. Uh, I didn't see much out of Pascal. I've seen him get in on a few plays. I didn't see anything out of Levi. I don't even know if Levi played. Um James Houston did not have his usual monster sack day. And that's okay, right? It, his role seemed to be a bit dialed back. And and I think it kind of makes sense uh, when we go back and, and look at what AG said. Um, during OTAs, you know, during training camp, AG addressed it a few times where he said that Houston needed to be more consistent like many players, but he also needed to have more of a responsibility than just rushing the quarterback. He needed to play within the scheme and understand his assignment to be able to have better success and to be able to stay on the field longer and and not just used in special circumstances. So I think that's kind of why we're seeing Houston playing in a different role. It doesn't mean it's going to be that way during the season. I think that they're just trying to give the kid a shot at seeing what he can do. Um, you know, this this scheme and assignment that he was in Friday night did not appear to be one of rushing the quarterback. It appeared to me like he was having to focus on his edge assignment. He was having to, to focus on his gap assignment, and he was able to help others, you know, create the play around him. And... You know, I think it speaks volumes, you know, more so of his technique and his ability that he, he's able to do these things. And he's going to be successful w- with it as long as he has more time to develop. Um, but like I said, AG made it known that Houston needs to be able to step up. He needs to play on more downs. He had to adopt a different role that didn't include always rushing the quarterback. Um, but Houston seemed to be more disciplined. He did stay home more uh, within his assignment. And he didn't. You know, he didn't lose his edge. There wasn't big gaping holes or plays coming off of his edge or his gap. Uh, he was in on all three downs, uh, you know, throughout some series in the, you know, during the game. Uh, he played more of a contributor role. Yeah, I guess that's what I call it. He contributed and yeah. he produced and, and he's forcing, you know, the edge inside and putting himself in the right place at the right time. His hat was always in and around the place. Yeah, he didn't get the stats, but he produced. So maybe that'll change next week. Maybe we'll see him in more of a rushing you know, role next week. Uh, but I expect the Lions to be very versatile with who's doing what any given week so that these defenses, or I'm sorry, the offenses don't get comfortable, right? They don't think that they have this, this defense dialed in, you know, while they're studying game film and they know what the Lions are going to do. I feel like they're going to plug and play guys differently each game to best suit the needs uh, of the defense, which, I mean, come on, every defense does it, right? They do. All right. So with that being said, we had two guys, James Houston and Kaminsky, that both played contributor-type roles or very productive roles. I think Kaminsky definitely had the better game, uh, you know, over Houston. And, and I don't think it's cause for concern either. I, I don't think that because Houston didn't, have five sacks or two sacks or even one sack, then it's cause for concern that Houston's not going to make this roster. I think it would take a lot for this kid not to make the roster. I don't even know who would step up over him at this point. Um, but, you know, I guess bigger things have happened uh, that didn't make sense either. But I just don't see that one happening. It, it, I don't think I don't think that's going to happen either, Will. That's, that'd be very – that'd be a shocker, honestly. 
Yeah, you know, firing somebody uh, after having an eight sack season and you know, what seven games? Yeah, I don't see how that bodes well for you or for the team. <laughs> so, the next guy I wanted to talk about tonight was uh, Jack Campbell, and uh, I don't have a ton on Jack because he wasn't in for. I don't think a long period of time and I could be wrong, but maybe it's just, he was blending too well, but I, you know, the plays that I did dissect and that I did look at, he seemed to stay within his coverage assignment really well. And, and I was really confident uh, about his ability when I saw how he protect protected the center of the defense very well. Uh, he did not, you know, fall back into coverage or run straight up, you know, into the, the offensive line. He scanned, you know, he assessed, he he made the calls, and when he committed, he committed. And when he committed, he was right. And he was in on, on the plays. He didn't let anything big happen. Um, I think that he's going to need more time to develop to play faster. But after what I saw of his first debut, I think he's moving right along in the right direction. Uh, he did get his hat in on, on many tackles. Uh, he definitely takes the right angles, which mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, a nice thing to see. And, you know, quite honestly, playing very consistent with discipline, his high football IQ uh, in his lateral range were definitely on display on Friday night. So we got to see a lot of the things that he was scouted for. Uh, small sampling size once again, but we'll see uh, We'll see more this week, hopefully. Um Next up, I got Rodrigo, uh, but who do you have on your your sheet there, Andy, that you'd like to talk about? I did want to – well, I mean, I kind of had something to get on Campbell. That would, Actually, I had Campbell on my sheet as well, Will. Um, go for it. The one thing I was – yeah, the one thing I'd say about Campbell, yeah, it's um, – you know, like I want to go back. You know, we brought up the play, again, that keeps coming up, the, the play with uh, Branch tackling Beasley. Like I remember I – you know, I looked over the film of that play – you know, and I saw Campbell was there, and he was kind of, he kind of was just back. He didn't look like he moved much. Like I thought he would have, you would have thought maybe he would have gone forward to assist with the play. But then as I looked at it again, you know, I'm watching him as he's, you know, he's crouching his stance, and the play is evolving. And I think the reason why he didn't move forward and slide forward the way he was supposed to is because I think he saw the way it was it was evolving, and there was probably no reason for him to go up in the area to assist with the play. But other than that, I agree. He was. We brought him in for the same. You know, for the good reasons that we did, his size, his speed, his able to read the offenses and what the runners are going to do. I, I think he was a great addition. And, you know, again, another, you know, I'll do the last time I say it is definitely a small sample size because there was a lot of that with some of these rookies we got. We didn't see a lot because of just comfort situations or, you know, probably also not wanting to run the risk too much of putting these players in so much. But, you know, he's another one to look for. He is another one to look for next week going forward. I think he's a great addition. And that's really all I had to say about it because you said a lot of the things I was already going to say about Campbell, Will. So I just wanted to give my quick little take on that. But actually, please, Will, since you brought him up, he is also one of my favorite players. What do you got on Rodrigo? <laughs> Rodrigo, I mean, he's the guy that doesn't disappear. So no. there's been a lot of talk about this linebacking core being so deep, you know, just like the, the – the defensive backs are really deep. The wide receivers are really the whole damn team is deep. Uh, but there's been a lot of a lot of talk about Rodrigo, you know, struggling to keep his position. And after what I saw on, on Friday night, uh, I would highly disagree that he's 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 not going to struggle to keep his position. I think it's this is going to be a defense that is potentially going to keep an extra linebacker. And they're going to run it deep, and they're going to pull and you know pull guys out and put guys in as they need to to keep fresh legs, fresh looks, and uh, keep everybody healthy. You know why put a guy in for you know 100 snaps a game? You know when when maybe you could give them 60 and and give them a longer season. Uh, Rodrigo, to me, what I noticed is that he likes to use his his little bit of a shorter frame, right, compared to the other guys, but. He likes to use his frame in a manner that is not consistent with football at all. And I love it. I love every minute about it. So he uses his wrestling experience, and this happened at one of his tackles on Friday night. 
that he uses his body with power, and when he when he makes the tackle, he wraps you up, and he like throws his legs out, and then he swings the guy over and slams him on the ground for no gain. Even though the guy was coming, you know, the running back was coming full speed ahead. He gets in front of him, he makes a stop, and he like whips him down to the ground. And, and I've seen this a few times out of Rodrigo. Matter of fact, I think he did it to the one of the Kelsey brothers in the Eagles game last year. Pretty positive he did. It might have made major headlines in the first week or preseason or something. I can't remember. I think it was the first week. Yeah. Um but he he that's that's the type of guy that Rodrigo is. He uses his experience and his knowledge of wrestling, you know, for him and for the benefit of his his football game. And when I see him make plays like this, he and he doesn't give up any leverage. He, he doesn't allow big plays to happen. Sure, he's in his second season. He's still learning. Uh, but he's a guy that I feel like is going to make a tremendous leap this season uh, as long as he's going to get, you know, the bevy of the snaps, which – there's just too many good linebackers on this team right now. Um, but again, you know, he was consistently and constantly engaging, uh, shedding blockers, limiting the effect of the Giants' heavy offensive line presence, and uh, in, especially in short yarded situations, he just does so well. Um, but Rodrigo is Rodrigo, man. He, he had a hell of a game on Friday night, he had a hell of a season last season. Uh, whether he's first string or second string, I'm happy that he's on this squad. So I expect them to, you know, to continue to do great things and, and to grow within this scheme. And, I, and honestly, I think this scheme is going to fit his play style, play style better than what the gap assignment did last season because now he's going to be able to be more free and he's moved over to a different position at the mic. I think he's at the mic side now um, where he's going to be able to make a lot of plays on the outside. So I'm excited to see that happen. Uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get past Rodrigo too many times. No. Next up for me is uh, the darling Starling Thomas. Uh, yes. You know, I, what do you got on him? You want me to go first? You want to go? Uh, no, I say the one thing about Starling Thomas that I, well, I like. I mean, it's one thing about him is he he showed his ability to find to find gaps and penetrate the line and get in the backfield, and he just he just had opportunities to make make the plays. I mean, he's that was just it was just something immediately that stood out about Starling to me. Uh, the little bit I did see of him play, uh, he just was always there, always went to, always did his job. There was really uh, the the few times I saw him play in the game, there was never anything he did that made me stand up and go like, "What are you doing?" I mean, he was always there at the right time, and he took every opportunity he could. I think he's an, well, actually you put it just perfectly, Will. I think he's a, another darling of the undrafted class. I'm really. Another player I'm looking forward to see quite a bit of coming in the next couple weeks of preseason. Yeah, I am too. He, he's been nothing short of exciting. Uh, he's made some pretty big plays in practice. Um, he got his hands dirty in, in Friday night's game. I, I didn't see a ton out of you know out of Thomas, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't there either. And uh, right. and I'd have to I have to look at the, the stat sheet again. I did see a couple plays, but. Look, he, he's if he's out there, he's out there for a reason, and that's because the coaching staff wants to get a better look at him so they can make an accurate decision on, you know, is this somebody that can, you know, make our practice squad? Is it somebody that is too good that's going to get picked up by somebody else? Do we want to take a chance at losing them? And if that's the case, what are they going to do with the guys that they have on the roster right now? You know, are they going to have to keep an extra DB so that they don't lose somebody like, like Thomas? Uh, but we'll see. He's another playmaker. Look, there's mm -hmm. there are some playmakers on this team. Yes. Everyone at the professional level, they're all great. Okay? Just some are much better than others. And some are scrappier than others. Some are grittier than others. The Lions have assembled all of them. They have a very, uh, you know, amazing group of guys that have just a quiver of uh, of, of ability and talent and and the resources are now endless and these guys are able to get out there and, and make plays <coughs> so i'm looking forward to see what he does next week so to end tonight's podcast there's there's something that 
I spoke about last year, and, and it's it's another willism, if you will. And that's that I see that this defense is really starting to work well together. And, and when it comes to production and stats, there's a style of defense called, and it's my defense, it's what I call it, called the hive. Imagine a beehive for a moment. You've got a hive of worker bees all working together. They do everything together. The only thing they do separately is when they when they fly off to go eat, right? Go find their pollen or whatever. But when they all come back, they all work together. Same thing's going on with this defense. Every single one of these guys is working for the brother next to him, working for the guy next to him, working for the guy in front of him, working for the guy behind him. And that creates a high defense that's going to, you know, rally around the, the ball carrier and, and make plays happen. So, you know, when these guys are working together to corral the offense, you know, the, so somebody can attack, we're going to see great things happen. We're already starting to see it. And we saw it last year and they're doing it unselfishly. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say that production is always better than stats. Unselfish players are some of the best players in the NFL that don't get talked about. And for me, I guess the biggest biggest takeaway again is, man, this one gap to, to one and a half gap switch, it's going to be exciting. Yes. So I'm is. ready for the season. I, I'm glad that we got you know the rust knocked off in preseason game one. I'm ready for preseason game two. Ready to see what happens during the week at practice. I'll be out there with the Jags uh, and the Lions. And uh, again, we gave out some tickets to some you know some lucky Rockdown Detroit Lions followers and fans. And uh, again, we appreciate you all uh, helping us out. Please do us a favor. All we ask is if you like what you hear, if you want to hear more, if you want us to get better, send us an email, send us a message, like, share, and subscribe. Help us grow. Our YouTube is our biggest driver right now, try, trying to get our YouTube count up. So if you could just subscribe, that would be great. And, uh, you know, you don't always have to hit the notification bell. You can later. We're still trying to work on our craft, and, and we've got a couple weeks left. We're in, we're in preseason training ourselves. So when it comes time for week one, you better believe the Rock Down Detroit Lions is going to come out swinging. So we thank you all yes, for always are. joining in. We see some some comments in, in the chat for whatever reason. I don't know what's going on tonight with this 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 software, but it's not letting me do anything. Um, so we'll get to them uh, offline. But that's all we had for tonight, Andy. Uh, what do you have left to say? No, that's pretty much it. Um, I think uh, just to go along with what Will said uh, about the Hive defense. Uh, we're going to have one of the most unstoppable defenses in the league this year, I believe, still, and I've been saying that for a while. Uh, if the way we played on Friday was any indication of that, again, let's be very careful. I know it's only preseason one. It's all the second and third stringers, but, you know, we have the second and third stringers in the defense in there and all that depth, and they're playing that well. I say I can't wait to see this team when they go to second and third week of preseason when they start gradually working the starters back in in preparation for the regular season. So it's exciting. And once again, it's an exciting time to be a Lions fan. So let's uh, let's all keep it together and keep on trucking behind this team of ours. All right. So I haven't done any of my predictions yet. And I wanted to start with my prediction. I told you I wanted to see the preseason game before I said anything. So here's where I'm at. Preseason one prediction. The Detroit Lions will finish 12 and 5. Now, I said it a couple weeks ago that, that they would win at least 12 games, but uh, after watching the preseason game and, and, and seeing how this defense is working together, the Detroit Lions are going to finish 12 and 5. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to get a playoff game. They're going to get a home playoff game, and they're going to win that game too. So that's where I'm at as far as my prediction so far. This Detroit Lions team is on their way. So stay tuned. Stay rocking. One pride. Go Detroit Lions. We'll see you all on Friday. Good night.